Good evening, everyone. My name is Zach Kenny. This is ZK Live. It is Sunday night. It is time for a Q&A. We have a number of questions that have been uh, submitted through our Instagram story. We're going to talk about some business stuff, spraying, um, priming. Some Somebody had a question about um, when to prime. Um, there's a couple of business things. And then obviously during throughout the show, there'll be more questions. So for anyone who's watching, if you are watching, please put your questions down at the bottom. There's a little uh, question mark. I am doing this podcast slash live show from my house tonight. I just couldn't get myself to drive to the shop for an eight, eight o'clock thing. So my wife has been kind enough to let me use the living room. Uh, I have one earbud in cause I, the other, I can't find my other earbud. I hope the audio is all right. Um, so, and tonight I have a cup of tea. How, how British of me. I'm drinking tea while I do my podcast. Um, but it's, you know, it's not super warm outside and, uh, I thought I'd have some tea. So let's get right into the questions. We're probably going to try to keep this under an hour tonight, unless a bunch more questions get asked. But, um, let's start with my friend. I'm guessing Jesus 94 C could be Jesus. Not sure. Uh, he asks best spray tip for doors and cabinets. All right. So again, I sh we struggle with the question best because best we needed to define best. Uh, we need to define the parameters that we are deciding how, how we'll choose the best. Um, I'll assume, so let's just assume a few things like, well, I would say the smaller the orifice size, generally the better. Um, as, as long as you can get the paint to atomize, using smaller orifice size will allow you to have a little more control or a lot more control, depending on the orifice size, um, of the paint that you're spraying. Um, again, it depends on what kind of machine you were using. There are, you know, with our conventional gravity fed cup guns, automotive style guns, we're using, uh, um, nozzles that have different, um, diameters. They're measured in millimeters. So we could be a 1.2, 1.3, 1 1.4, all the way up to like 2.2. Uh, we've most often with those, we're going to use a 1.4. Um, sometimes we use a 1.3, sometimes 1.5. We have a 2.0 for, uh, that we don't ever use anymore. Um, so if you're using a, something like that, I would say a 1.4 is generally what we're going to use. Um, if we're talking about an airless, um, I, I'm not sure how many of you guys saw this, but my friend Nick Slavic, who I have so much respect for, he's an amazing uh, thought leader in our industry. He There was a question on a Facebook post someplace that said, like, what tips are you using for different materials or something? And he published, he like put up a spreadsheet that he had for his company and it's and it had like every surface that you might paint with a sprayer from interior exterior trim cabinets walls ceilings you name it and true to nick true to form i believe nick had two tips two airless tips total for all surfaces right nick likes to keep it simple that's what he always talks about how do we keep it simple well for a company like Nick's, who he has a, a low average skill set in his company, like average, I wouldn't say skill set, years experience, let's just say that, I'm not here to judge the skill set. Um, so he just said, well, here's the only kind of primer, maybe they have two primers they use, they have one kind of wall paint, one kind of trim paint, right, he keeps it really simple. And so he, I, I can't remember the tip sizes he had. You reach out to Nick, ask him, but he, ha I believe it was like a 412 and like a 517, fine finish, low pressure, one for interior, one for exterior. That's a great way to go about it. Um, but for what we're doing, I am more concerned about finish quality than anything. Um, I will sacrifice some time and I will have my team performing at a higher level in order to get that. Um, so we are not going to limit tip sizes across all things in our company like that. But I will say we use the same, again, with the air assist airless, we're going to use the same couple tips. It depends on the, the material that we're spraying. 
um, and the substrate that we're spraying. Um, but generally you want to lean towards smaller. The smallest size tip that will atomize your paint, if you're painting cabinets and doors, that's what I would start with. And your limiting factor there could be a little bit of time. You might say, well, I'm, it's taken me too many passes or I've had to go over it too many times. Um, and so I want to speed that process up and maybe I can get the same finish. Maybe I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of finish quality and I want a larger orifice size. So we think about orifice size when we're talking about spray tips generally. Um, unless you're doing, I don't know why you wouldn't want a fine, if you're using airless, why you wouldn't just want to use a fine finish, low pressure tip, the FFLP as they're called. Um, when those first came out, man, what a game changer those tips are. Um, they really allow, they soften the pattern, um, and they allow you to spray at a lower pressure. Um, and, and they're awesome. So best spray tip for doors, man, that, that next time I, I like a little more information. Jesus, are you here? If you're here, please write in with like, what product are you using? What, what are you trying to do? Get the, per, the, the finest finish. Like, you know, there's context that has to go into answering a question like this. Um, there's, you can't just say there's one blanket answer. Um, because you could say a 1.3 on a SADA jet 5,500 is the best spray tip. Well, that might get the finest finish using Hall and Lack which, you know, arguably I think it probably does. Um, but if we didn't care about finest finish and we cared about spraying an entire commercial building with um, primer or whatever, ceiling paint, we might look at like a, a 623, right? A large orifice and a wide fan, put a lot of paint on fast. That's going to be best. So again, I, I would say it's sort of a subjective, um, we need more parameters to define best. But I would say generally you want to use the smallest tip that you can get good. If you're doing finish, fine finish work like this, you want to use the smallest size orifice. I'm not a huge fan of the really narrow spray, spray fans. If you're going to spray larger surfaces, even like doors or cabinets. Uh, if you're spraying cabinet boxes, yeah, that's a different story. But if you're spraying the doors um, separate, generally, you know, a, two, a 208, a 210... Is probably like to, in my to me that's too small. You're doing too many passes over that door to, with a four inch fan. Um, it kind of defeats the purpose of having an airless, and you might as well just open that fan up a little bit. Um, you know, but it's again more. Qu someone, some, maybe someone just put a question. Maybe it's him. We have a new question. Uh, how do you see which one's new? Oh, just now. Um, well, so I'll end on that. If you have, if you have any follow-up questions, Jesus, please feel free to put them in here if anyone wants more clarification on that. But that's kind of the best answer I can give you at, at this time. And piggybacking from that, we'll go to Aguiar Farm, who said, can you achieve a smooth finish on a built-in with a brush or is spray the only way to go? Oh, what perfect timing for this question, my friend. Um... If you, you could probably look, I don't know, I've been posting pretty frequently. So I don't know, maybe five posts back, there is a fo hashtag follow the light challenge. Uh, a, it's a brushed, it's a couple of cabinet doors that are brushed and a top of a um, sort of desk, desktop type of thing that are brushed. And, you know, uh, to say that's not a smooth finish uh, would be lying. It's you so you definitely can apply you can get a smooth finish with a brush. You can't I mean you'll always be able to tell if it's brushed or sprayed, right? There'll always be subtle brush strokes. I've yet I don't think I've ever seen a substrate where I'm like, I can't tell if that's brushed or sprayed if I'm being really, really particular, trying to figure out what was the mode of paint application. Um but that's I mean I think Brushing cabinetry, uh, built-ins, is arguably the most desirable. Uh, no, I wish that's. I take that back. Not desirable is is a very at the high end, especially 
Um, it's it is a very desirable aesthetic in certain situations. Um, so if you're in a super modern house, like, no, I would not brush built-ins. I, then I would think you were doing a disservice to the design aesthetic of the home. Unless the designer was adamant, um, I would, I would stay away from that because modern finish, modern home with the minimalism and all that stuff, you want to have a sprayed finish. Uh, but a brush finish on an older home, like a more traditional style home, you know, there's, it comes down to client, like what do they want? But man, it's a beautiful, beautiful look to see the subtle brush strokes. Or we just did that project in Westerly where we did very pronounced brush strokes. And that looks awesome because it fits the home. The home, it's a beautiful place, tons of millwork, and they want it to look like it was, you know, a couple hundred years old, but had had a restoration. And so the architect and designer had a, and a, a vision in their heads and they wanted pronounced brush strokes. They wanted to see the ropiness that you would see if you went to Europe in many places. They, in Holland specifically, they have, you know, very pronounced brush strokes. Um, and so that's not, I wouldn't call it a smooth finish, but you can, uh, you can definitely, you play around with it. You know, I, lots of, I mean, there's lots of people who are having their cabinets brushed and rolled all the time. If they can't, I mean, obviously, Honestly, I think it's the cheapest way to go to for the boxes. Um, I think at the the most budget conscious clients and painters are using a spray the cabinet doors, cut brush and roll the boxes type of model, and they're getting great results. Clients are happy, but in the sales process, I'm sure they're saying like, "Hey, your finish on your cabinet boxes is going to be different than what's on your doors." Uh, as long as you communicate that and you say like, in order to, like, if that's okay with you, I can take X hundreds or thousands of dollars off the price by not masking this entire room off and spraying it, you know, but can you, to answer the question specifically, you can achieve a smooth finish. You cannot achieve it. You cannot achieve an exactly the same, cannot tell if it's been sprayed or if it's been brushed. Maybe I couldn't tell. I mean, plenty of times probably clients can. We've, we have um, cut and rolled boxes for touch up one time we had to, we did it and it was a low sheen white which is obviously very forgiving and Zach a painter we had not not myself um, he went on site with a brush and roller and laid out Ilva um, on a couple of uh, inset fa uh, face frame inset cabinets so we had sprayed the cabinet face the drawer and the face frame around it is flush with it and he brushed that and the client was particular and it looked great if now if i went in with the follow the light challenge and we like super analyzed it could you tell it was brushed yeah probably could the client from standing up looking at their thing no right and and so i wouldn't say you can't a, a find a good a smooth finish with a brush it just depends on what is the product you're using What's the color, you know, darker colors are going to be less forgiving. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's an absolute no. Plenty of ways to get a smooth finish with a brush. Uh, but spray is obviously going to be significantly easier to do that with. Thanks for your question. Oh, we got two new ones. I guess I'll just keep doing the new ones because I'll assume that those people are here. And so why not? All right. SNN painting. So how do you block all of du the dust in the house where you brush that desk because the finish is unreal? Honestly, I should read. Oh man, I really should read these first. Someone's going to get me one of these days. Uh, honestly, honestly, unreal. Exclamation mark. Well, thank you very much. Our team is really proud of that. I'm really, I'm sorry. I'm really proud of our team. I know they're proud of the work that they did. Hollis and Phil, um, putting their heart and soul in, into that one as they we do with every project. Um, how do we block the dust? All right, so that space is treated exactly like we were spraying. Um, we have built, we have set that that space up, that kitchen, with with air movers inside scrubbing. One air, air I believe at the time they had a scrubber going. Uh, but we also have air sucking out of the booth. We've made a booth, right? We've made an airtight space in that kitchen. We have, ma we masked off, they masked off up above the cabinets where the 
cabinets meet the walls, there was a cavity between, uh, of actually the wall cavity was showing. Like you could look down and see, I believe, in between the studs, right? Well, if we're trying to get a dust-free environment and we are being insanely particular, right? And we don't want any dust. Well, guess what? That's a huge place that dust is going to come in, right? If we're trying to be perfect, if we're pretending like Ebola is dust and we will die if we get any on us, we need to be so conscious of every little place that dust can get into our space. Just like if you were going to build a biohazard containment zone to keep Ebola from leaving it while you did research, you would be thinking about every single possible way dust could come in, right? So the first step is to assess the situ situation and figure out where can dust come from, right? And so we're going to block all those spaces. And then we're going to, then we want to say, okay, well, we want to control all the air in this space. So we're going to take the air. <laughs> Phil said he dies when he gets dust. So dust could possibly be actually Ebola in Phil's case. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so we're going to control the air in the space. The answer is you have to control the air coming in. You have to filter it perfectly and you need to suck the air out. And so that you can create a negative airspace where all the air coming in is air that you control, that we control, right? We have said here air, we can let you through these filters nowhere else into this room. And then we're going to take all the air. Then we're going to suck the air out at a rate higher than what comes in. And so that's honestly the way to do it. And then they, we, they wore Tyvek suits. They suited up like they were trying to protect themselves from Ebola. They suited up like they were saying I wasn't using the app. That's a weird new feature to Instagram. I'm definitely using the app Instagram. Um, so yeah, we, we treat a brushed, you know, a high level brush situation like that. Um, like we're spraying high gloss black oil, right? Everything, right? Every little, we are trying to identify where can dust come into our sub, our, into our place, right? Let's, let's get creative. How in the world, right? We don't want to see when the sun comes shining in the room, all the dust like floating in the air, right? That is not acceptable. Um, in these cases, when we're trying to apply the highest level finish, that's not acceptable, especially if you're using an oil and you're doing a horizontal surface. So I hope that answered your question. For more, we have at ZK Finishing School, we go, you know, three and a half, four, we go about three and a half hours on this subject uh, specifically, and we build a space and we go over the whole thing. Um, it's a key part of what we do at finishing school. Um, all right. We have another new question. I'm going to read it before I put it up just to be safe, even though I know this guy and I'm sure he's not messing with me. All right. That looks safe. Um, I say Russell Kredulis in my head when I read your name. I don't know if that's how you say it, but Russell asks, used... Eurolux mat for the first time. Beautiful pigment pigment density. Can the open time be lengthened with extender? You would have thought I served this question up and asked him to ask me this. Because, yes, Russell, I have an answer to your question. It is, you can use an extender. And if you're going to use an extender, I would highly recommend using General Finish's uh, latex extender. I believe it's called Enduro extender. That is a super full of VOCs extender. It's like a thousand VOCs per, per liter, which we love, right? No, it, it's gonna off gas, right? So we we, we do a, a demonstration at ZK Finishing School. Uh, if, if you were to put some of this stuff in a cup, it's completely clear. And if we left it in a cup long enough, there'd be nothing left in that cup. If we took some Floetrol, anyone using Floetrol, stop. Give it to your kids for art projects. Floetrol is for art projects. It is not for high level or professional painters. There's just no reason. I just can't tell me a reason. Someone convince me I'm wrong. Floetrol, see you later, bud. You are for art projects. Because if we left some Floetrol in a cup and let that dry, we would come back and we would have a disc, a white disc of material, right? You can paint. You can do art projects with Floetrol. Well, if I have a beautiful gallon of paint that was designed by Fine Paints of Europe or other high-level manufacturers who put pure, high-quality ingredients in their paint, why do I want to take this 
random cheap stuff. I don't know what's in Floetrol. What is that stuff that's drying and staying solid? I don't want to put that into my paint, right? When the difference is just go buy a different product. It's not like we're talking about thousands of dollars of uh, material or product or anything like that. So I'll get off my soapbox, but uh, I, honestly, this is an hour of me on a soapbox. I don't, I'm going to stay on my soapbox, I guess. Um, but yes, I would, we, a hundred percent of the time we are using extender in our Euro Lux, specifically the mat. There's some, what you can get the, the results we did, a, a we do, we do some wall stuff at ZK finishing school, right? We go over this product and we go over the extender and all that stuff. And then we use it. And we did a test sample where we sanded, sanded some primer down and we rolled out one coat. I mean, it's smooth as a baby's bottom. It, it's like, it's like cabinet grade finish off of a roller on a wall. Nothing better. Thanks, Russell. See, I gotta, I gotta learn to keep the diet. Like the, I go off on these tangents, man. I'm, John's, John's from Paint School has questions that I'm afraid of, so we're gonna get to those later. All right, I gotta read these. Keep reading these questions first. When using the craft brushes from, my, oh. All right, this seems normal, safe enough. Peter the Great said, while using the craft brushes from Michaels the other day, the brush fibers literally came out in bunches. This is me reading a novel. Uh, if there's too many, it wouldn't come up. The brush literally came out in bunches after using it for an hour. Is this a normal problem? Now, Instagram will not show me any more of that question. So if you had more to that question, I don't know what to tell you, but... We'll, we'll pretend like that was all of the question. Yeah, man, that's normal. Those brushes cost under $3 a piece. I don't know what they cost. They're insanely cheap. So you want to buy a lot of them, and you might throw a few out. You like Some of them are going to be built crappy. Some of them last. I don't know. You have to ask Phil how long they last. We are looking at, uh, we have a new rule that we use it for the job for that day, and then we throw it out. And... We were talking about the math on that. Five for three dollars. No, five dollars for three. That is a very cheap brush, right? So if you have a cheap brush and you have expensive thinner, right? Say we're using oil, which is the only we use those brushes for. We have expensive thinner. We're <laughs> we're fancy, right? We're, we're so fancy, we're going to just throw our brushes away at the end of every job. That's what we tell clients. Oh, your, your job's going to be so good, sir, that we're going to throw the brush away at the end of every day. That's how fancy we are. No, we're not using it because we're fancy. We're using it because it's the most cost-effective way that we have found to lay out a great finish. Now, you could buy a $60 Stallmeister and get the same results. I was advocating for that. Phil convinced me otherwise. The, the amount of time... And the amount of money in solvent, never mind the ecological damage that we're doing to the earth, but while well, you're throwing these other ones away. So that's a, that's a bad point. Let's just talk about the money from a business standpoint. If I have thinner, I have to clean out this brush with and time. And then I have to dispose of the thinner safely. We have a 55 gallon container at our shop that we dump all the dirty thinner in. And then we have to have that carted off at some point for I don't want to even know how many hundreds of, hundreds of dollars. So if it's between that and throwing away a brush that costs less than $2, we're throwing away that brush all day. And that also means that you're not going to, like, I don't think they probably don't even have a quality control employee at the entire company of Craftsmart, right? They just build brushes. Does it look like a brush? Send it out, right? And so what do you do? You end up with like, I don't know, Phil could tell you the ratio of good brushes to bad. Maybe it's 50-50. So buy a lot of brushes. I don't know, hit it around, throw it off a building, see how it like lasts before you start using it. Um, but we have had plenty of brushes who that don't have bristles that fall apart in the first use. Um, so just make sure you have enough br brushes to be able to throw out a batch. Sometimes it's like a whole batch, like a whole container worth, which is like what, three brushes. Um, so I don't know, I hope that answers your question, but yes, you get what you pay for in some, 85% of them are good, Phil estimates. See, it's even better. These brushes, man, I, I, we bought a bunch of stock and craft brushes. So I'm here just promoting it just to be for selfish reasons. I just want to make a bunch of money on that stock. 
um, of craft brushes. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know that you can buy stock and craft brushes, but if you could, uh, we are probably, uh, would be, it would probably be a good idea to do that. Um, you're welcome, Peter. It was my pleasure to answer that question for you. Um, Turner said he's thrown some straight out of the package. Yes, I believe that is the case. Um, others use for an hour and they fall apart. Um, there you go, man. It costs doing business. It's a very low cost. All right. I think I saw there's another new one. Yeah. From two minutes ago. Here we go. Decorative desires. Ooh, cool name. Hold on. I'm going to have a sip of tea. First, I have to get my tea bag out. Do any of you guys, any of you other guys do that? Anybody else do this? I, I don't leave my tea bag in. I try not to leave it in for too long. My wife, on the other hand, she'll just leave it in forever. Sometimes. I'm going to have a sip of vanilla caramel tea. Oh, so good. Okay. Decorative desires. You have a brush and you have spray and brush finishes dialed in. But have you ever experimented slash tested roll finish gloss? No. I, I mean, I, eh, I, don't, I don't know. I haven't. I'm sure Phil has played around with it. Um, if that's the look that the client's after, hey man, yeah, it's it's uh it's Papa Bear. It's my Papa Bear mug, and uh, you could fit about a gallon worth of tea in here. <sighs> I have a little nephew. Every time he drinks something, <sighs> hilarious. So now I like to do it every once in a while. It is a very satisfying thing to do. Everybody do it. Try it next time you're drinking something. <sighs> this makes you want to smile. Um, have you test? Have you ever experimented and tested with a roll finish gloss? Uh, no. Um, I mean, yeah, Phil's testing it now. I know, I know, guys. I've heard through the grapevine of guys who roll and leave it. So it's not an unheard of thing to do. But have we done it? I can I can say I have never done it. And uh, I'm not super excited about the idea of doing it. Um, personally, I think that... I mean, hey, let's be fair. Let's be real. Let's all, like, I want to get real with you guys right now. Let's get real. Uh, I would bet my life that... Now, that's actually... I'll bet half my life <laughs> that... Uh, it, a rolled gloss finish is not going to look the same as a sprayed finish. And is not going to look the same as a brushed finish. And is not going to look better than either the, either two of them, aesthetically. And because I'm in the game of giving client very particular clients the, the highest level results that are possible, I probably am not going to be selling that or pr playing with it very much. Um, I would say... Well, let's see what Decorative Desires says. Do you say desires every time you say your name? Same prep to spray high build oil primer and flat sand, but finish with something like a four inch, mi four millimeter microfiber. I'm in the process now. Great. Now, if you put that next to a sprayed finish, can you tell the difference? Is there roller stipple? Um, generally, I would be averse to that. At the high end, fine finish, Clients are very particular. We we're trying to be different than all the competitors because I would imagine it would look pretty similar to orange peel in sprayed tech in sprayed finish, which the quote unquote competition, the other guys who are cheaper, oftentimes you're going to get pretty heavy orange peel in a sprayed finish gloss, which I'm not trying to compete with that. I'm trying to give them glass. And so I, I don't know. Uh, my gut says, no, I'm not really into that. But I, you know, convince me that I'm wrong. That's what we're here for. It's the beauty of live, right? I, I've been playing with this idea. I ha obviously I'm going to do the Q and A's live. I have been playing with the idea of editing the interview on Tuesdays and then posting it uh, to keep people's attention, not have the down spots, not have me stop to drink tea. Um, the connection issues that we have with the live sometimes. I don't really know. 
I'm still on the fence about it. But uh, the beauty of the live that we are in tonight is that you can give me feedback. And if you think that your rolled finish looks as good as sprayed, I'd love to hear it. Are you doing it because it's more cost effective? I have to think that you're doing it because it's more cost effective. Which, there is a bunch of clients who will value that. And I think it's probably a great idea. I know lots of people who are doing it. Uh, at some level. Just not with gloss on, that I know of. Well, I, I just said I know some people. So, I, I have known some people on ceilings. Which I would hope level out better. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I've never done this. I'm going to stop talking about this. Um, best ones I've used are the Purdy Ultra Smooth Finish Weenie Roller. But only with advanced and emerald urethane. Never tried with oil. Uh, <laughs> somebody said, nah, dude, keep the tea in. I'll give you another uh, big Papa Bear tea sip for you. Half the people are going to leave. They're like, I'm not watching this guy drink tea. I came to get pain information and he's drinking tea? What the heck? He's probably got his legs crossed. And, no. <laughs> um, all right. On to, oh, wow. We just keep getting new questions. I haven't even gotten to the ones that we started with. Sorry, people, if you're here, I will get to your questions. But I'm asking, I'm answering the ones for people who are definitely here right now. Here we go. It's Nathan. Yo. Oh, man. What a great name. What's hand tools? Sorry. What? Oh, tea pinky. I'll get the tea pinky up next time. What hand tools would you recommend a painter's always keep in his grip? Um, well, I think I would say you got to have a five in one. You got to have a utility knife. Um, you got to have a butter knife and a steak knife, fork, spoon, soup spoon, um, a salad fork. Uh, God, no, don't keep those things in your, in your grip. Uh, don't listen to me about things. I don't know. I'm in a weird mood right now. My dog just like puked nine times right before this. She ate an entire container of delicious desserts that my mom made. And, uh, it was supposed to be to give to my employees. And then we were talking to my mom outside and my dog ate a bunch of food and then we had to make she actually made herself puke, and then she's been puking forever. So, I don't know why I told you guys that. Five and one. There's Oh, there's a post on Phil's page about on-site tools. A spring set. People love those. I'm not one of them. I know. People love those. I just, I've never, yeah, mom, bury that entire freaking container of peanut clusters, cherry mash bars. I don't know what else was in there because I didn't even get to open it. So she's been uh, freaking out ever since. Um, oh yeah, you gotta have a dust brush. That's pretty key. Um, yeah, I'm not a spring-loaded nail set fan, personally. Uh, I am definitely a hammer and nail set kind of guy. Generally, in my experience, when I have to set, when I've had to set nails, when because what happens when you have that? And it, it's say a new construction setting, which is most often when you're gonna set nails right if i have to set a nail it's because the nail didn't go all the way into the substrate but all the other ones did hopefully otherwise the guy was just complete dope which means it's going to be pretty hard to get that nail back in because it's got it's you know it's it's hit something a stud a metal stud uh, i don't know what uh generally and i know there's lots of people who love those so this is just my personal opinion i like the control that you get with a hammer and a nail set um I, I, the freaking pulling that thing back and making sure it doesn't get your fingers when you let go. I, I don't know. I just never enjoyed those things. I tried them a couple times and I was like, get these things out of my life. I like being in control and the control of a nail set and a hammer. And I, I control the angle I'm putting down and the, I, I don't know. That's just me. But I do know lots of people like them and I'm not here to knock it. I don't even set nails anymore. I'm not in the field. So you know, take it with a grain of salt. But um, I would say a, a hammer and nail set for sure. You definitely need screwdrivers. Um, you got to take, you know, taking face plates off. Um, a marker. Marker is huge. Because um, when you take things off and you got a, a baggies would be really cool uh, if you want to go there. Um, someone said a roller spinner. Um, <laughs> not on my company. 
I, I Phil just posted, made a post about it, and he could tell you why. I didn't even ask him why. It was a cool video. But uh, I don't want my people cleaning out rollers at all. That Talk about a not a cost-effective thing. It goes back to the, the brush thing. Throw away the roller, man. <laughs> if we were to clock how long and how many gallons of water it takes to clean out a roller versus what the cost is to buy a new one, man, I want my people producing. I don't want them cleaning rollers. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to give a veto personally to the roller spinner, but to each his own. Um, you can, you can do one of these with a brush and get it spun out pretty good. Um, but, um, let's see the marker is huge. Love the marker. Jessica Allred. What, what does she have? that's different. Like a notepad. Jessica keeps a notepad always, which I love that idea, right? A notepad and a pen. Oh, remember if you guys... Flashback to Jessica Allred's episode on this show. She said her favorite, I believe she said her favorite piece of paint paraphernalia was a multicolored pen, right? You know those pens where you can like click the like five different heads and they're different colors and it's one pen. That's a great tool. Um, I probably none of my guys have one of those, but it's, if you're thinking about this enough to ask the question, Hey, there's a lot to be said for a little notebook, um, and a multicolored pen if you're especially in the world Jessica lives in where she's taking lots of notes she's getting like processes down to a science as far as time time wise how many minutes did we let this sit before we did this next step because she's doing crazy faux finishing matching of things touching up things um so that's all I can think of off the top of my head what else Screwdriver. I already said that. I, um, oh, man. I don't know. <laughs> I'll stop now. That's what I got. It's Nathan Yo. Thank you for your question. That guy's probably pretty cool. He has a Yo at the end of his Instagram name. All right. Well, that's the end of the in live, the live questions that we have so far. So we'll get into the people who uh, gave me questions ahead of time. Um... I'm going to put a question up just to laugh at it, and maybe you guys can inform me. I could have just Googled this answer, but um, I'm, in a, I'm in a silly mood. So, um, Bemonster, Bemonstar, I don't know. He said, are you on that Love Me app? Anybody know what the Love Me app is? I don't know. I'm definitely not on it because I don't even know what it is. I've never even heard of it. Maybe he's just making it up. So I'd see if I would put it up on my uh, Q&A. But um, anybody on the Love Me app? I think uh, we got someone looking for people. I don't really know. Um, while Let's put this question up. This was a new one. Just came in. Fresh off the presses. Or what do they say? Extra, extra. Right off. The, I don't know. Something about newspapers that people used to say. Wild Iris Music says, how much do you extend the Eurolux? Someone, my friend uh, Mark Spatcher, God, I think that's what his name, um, he asked me last night the same exact question. He was using Eurolux Matt for the first time. Um, the, on the bottle it says some ratio, I believe it's like 8 to 16 ounces per gallon is recommended. I have yet to find what is too much <laughs> because again, we're talking about thinning it and none of it being left behind. And especially if you're talking about Eurolux, which is like pure paint. I've thinned Holland like 30, 40% quite frequently. High, high quality, pure paint, like fine paints of Europe can be thinned extensively. You cannot take a Sherman Williams or Benjamin Moore product and thin it 30%. Good luck. It's already thinned 30%. It just, it's not thin. It's it's been diluted 30%. It's just not thin. It's thick, but it's full of nothing, right? In order to make it cheap, they fill it full of talc, mica, inert th clay, inert things that are cheap. They dilute the paint with. Fine paint is not a diluted paint, so you can dilute it with thinners or extenders all you want, especially ones that aren't going to stay behind. Um, play with it, but yeah, you can go go heavy on that stuff. You, I've yet to see a, an issue. Um, someone just said, uh, that app sounds freaky. He's going over to the app store now. Uh-oh. 
Maybe that guy just he just started an app called Love Me and he's trying to like get promos and he's got some bot just answering people's questions on Instagram. With have you been on the Love Me app? Have you heard about it? I heard it's pretty cool. Um, all right. Let's go back to back questions for Wild Iris Music. Can you leave oil paint in your sprayer like you can with water based? Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you. No, I don't leave don't leave paint in sprayers. That's just bad practice. I don't leave paint in sprayers. I, I I'm not going to say you can with either of those or any paint. Just don't leave them in sprayers. I, I know people do it. Have I done it in the past? In the past, a long time ago. We haven't left paint in a sprayer in a long time. But we have in the past. Um I don't know, man. Like just don't leave stuff in sprayers, clean them. But yeah, I mean, can you leave oil in a sprayer? How long? Yes, I'm sure you can. Um, I would, if you're going to leave paint in a sprayer, make sure to, I, I would leave it like under pressure. I don't, I don't, let's not, let's not talk about how to leave paint in sprayers. That is not something we condone here on the ZK live show at ZK painting. Zach Kenny doesn't condone that. Um, let's just, I think ZK Finishing School doesn't condone it. <laughs> let's not leave paint in our sprayers as a rule. And let's just keep it there. Um, yeah. But a slow oil, I would feel better about a slow oil, slow oil than a fast drying water based. But that's all I will say on that subject. No, I can definitely not condone that. Do you concur, sir? I do not concur. Name that movie. First one that answers, I'll send you a t-shirt. Um, just the whole sprayer in water, no air, no problem. Oh, just put the whole sprayer in water, no air, no problem. Hey, oh, there. now that's a thought. You want to leave paint in your sprayer? Submerge the entire sprayer in whatever solvent you were using for that paint. That will make it so that it is not going to dry. It's just like being in a bucket. Brilliant. Brilliant. We got some smart people here, folks. All right. My friend, uh, oh, I don't know him, but um, David Summers says, when painting a new color on walls, do you prime the entire surface for a new coat slash color? This is a great question. And the question is, sometimes. The an I'm sorry. The answer is sometimes. Or it depends. And I'll tell you what it depends on. Um, before I forget, oh no, I have to answer this question. If you have questions, please put them down at the bottom in a little question mark thing so that I can get to them. Otherwise, I'm going to cut off my friend David here and I'm going to answer your question so I don't forget about it. I'm going to start talking about it like this, distracting everybody. So do me a favor, put the questions at the bottom. So if I have a high quality paint job, like I have, I have, uh, intact surface, right? My paint is on my walls is, is in good shape. Uh, doesn't seem to be super. Well, let's start. Let's start. I'm going to prime. Here's when I'm going to prime. If my substrate does not look like it's in good condition, if I have like stains, I'm worried about. Um, and mostly, well, it, it, I think everyone kind of gets those. The main one is I'm going to prime. If I'm using a dark color, that has any type of sheen to it, that has any type of angular light that's going to hit it, right? And, and a particular client. We've all used like a navy matte wall paint. And when you finish rolling, you do everything in your power. I can, I, I can remember the jobs doing this, right? And every roller, I'm going down, down. Well, I finished them all down. Because the first time they tell you, oh, well, did you finish all your roller strokes in the same direction? Like, oh no, sometimes I go up, sometimes I go down. Let me go back and go down on all of them. Well, when you look down the wall, you can see the sheen inconsistencies in that matte navy emerald, in that case, paint, right? I'm pretty sure every painter in here has seen the sheen inconsistencies in, say, a darker color with some sheen to it, right? Well, if I have that situation and I want to prevent that, the best way to prevent the sheen inconsistency is to use a high quality primer and prime the entire surface, right? We would use Fine Paints of Europe nine times out of 10. So if 
if because what's happening when you see those sheen inconsistencies is generally is a it's a difference in mill thickness of paints on that substrate and so you see a sheen difference so we're trying to get the same amount of paint on all surfaces in these situations so we want to have a substrate that is absorbing paint at the same exact rate and so if, if i take an old existing wall paint and i spot hit a couple spots with some primer and blah 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 and just in general if i have not controlled my substrate i am much more likely to get an inconsistent coverage and the paint just sucking up into the wall at different rates which would give me a different sheen as i look down the wall so when i have those high level uh, as far as visibility, darker colors, and sheen in particular clients, I'm going to full prime my walls um, with, in this case, Five Pins of Europe Universal Primer or Eco Primer or Oil Primer, whatever. One of those primers that when it dries and I put paint over the top of it, it will be a uniform layer of absorption. And the absorption will be uniform, which means if I put a uniform amount of paint on, it should all lay out and be uniform and not have an incons inconsistent sheen. That is the sort of the tricky reason why we would use primer. It's why we just prime and, and, and how about this? <coughs> Say, uh, oh, did you, did you answer the question correctly? Um, I, no one answered that question. I just made a quote from a movie real fast. No one heard it. I was going to give a shirt away. Um, <laughs> do you concur? I concur, sir. Oh, yeah. Do you concur? Something like that. If you tell me the movie you're talking about concurring in. Um, so we just finished that garage, right? And we knew we were going to do masking. We were going we were gonna to be masking lines. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You got it. Send me a DM and I'll send you a t-shirt. Catch me if you can. Tremendous, tremendous movie. I don't watch a lot of movies more than once. That's one I can. I do like that movie. Um, so... On that garage, we knew we were going to be masking lines. And when we know we're going to be masking to paint, like, yeah, then I definitely want to use primer too, right? Again, it's cheap insurance. I want to make sure I'm bonded. Um, so we use primer for that reason because we knew we had like a low grade, like either builder's grade flat or primer. It was probably just builder's primer on the walls. We sanded those and then we use our own primer. So we had good adhesion as our base coat. Then we put our top coats on. Then we masked to it. And then when we peeled our tape, magically the paint stuck to the surface. Um, I hope that answers your question. Boom, we had three new questions. I'm never going to get out of here. Three new questions just while I talked. All right. Peter the Great, what's the best sanders you guys have used? I'm either going for Surf Prep or Festool. Um... I will tell you, I am Festool over Surf Prep all day, every day, as far as the sanders go. And I would dare somebody to prove me wrong. Um, the Merca, if you're going the square sander and you're doing fine finish, you're doing cabinetry, the Merca square sander, in my experience, is the best square or rectangle, really. We call them squares, but it's a rectangle. Um, the Merca three by five, tremendous, tremendous sander. Uh, I'm just not a fan of surf prep, man. I call bullshit, I guess. I, I just, I have not seen, I, I think that they're, they are similar to, uh, oh man, they're going to, people are going to screw, whatever. I think they're like Pharaoh and Ball. I think they're a great marketing company. They have some influencers who push those products hard. If you're on a certain forums, you get scoffed at if you say anything bad about surf prep. And I don't, you know, whatever. If people have financial incentives to do things, I get it. But as far as comparing the surf prep to the Merca, it's not even close. Like I, I just, I'm sorry. I wouldn't call it close. I think similar to Pharaoh and Ball, I think Pharaoh and Ball has great color and crappy paint. I think Surf Prep, I don't think Surf Prep has anything crappy. I'm not going to say that at all. I think they have great abrasives from what I understand. People love their abrasives. So if you're wondering, I you know, play with some Surf, surf Prep abrasives. I think they're an abra they are an abrasives company. They don't, as far as, well, I'm not going to talk. I don't think they make that standard from the ground up 
they create the parts in a factory and they like I don't think they make that sander. Now maybe they were I so don't listen to me really on this. I don't think it's the sander that makes surf prep special or why people buy their products. The actual machine. In my experience, I'm just I, it's the abrasives that people love, I believe. I could be wrong. Uh, but if you take a ETS 150 and put it next to the surf prep comparable product, it's not the, it, I, that's just me. Uh, I think they make great, good, great abrasives from what I understand. <sighs> it's just not, I just, I've, I've tried, I have not, I've not tried a lot of their products, but my, I've had a number of people on my team who I gave the three by four sander to and said, let it rip. Tell me your honest opinion. I did not tell them what I was leaning toward one way or another. And let's just say that sander is a beautiful multicolored paperweight, but I know a bunch of people who freaking love them. So whatever, man. Um, but there you go. So, they're an American company, though. So, like, represent them. And I know I've, I've heard from people they have great management. The people who work there are awesome. So, like, I don't want to – all I would say is that I think – I tend to see heavily biased information about surf prep and Apollo. Man, I wish people – like, I, I'm here to say – like, I – like, I'm not a huge fan of turbine units. I think they're fine, but at the fine finish, and I think there are other ways to get what you can out of, get out of a turbine unit. I'm going to stop talking now. All right. I didn't read this one. It was really long, but SNS, SNN asked a decent question, but not a crazy question before. So, SNN Painting said, tried to spray door with the FPE, used a Graco handheld battery, operated airless, total disaster. I could have told you that, man. Total disaster. Didn't tint it at all. Do you tint the paint before you spray? Do you tint the paint before you spray? Uh, I think you might be asking a question backwards. Uh, 100% of the time, the paint we use is tinted. Um, unless they don't want tinted paint and it's white out of the gallon. I, I, I'm not sure what you mean by that. But I will tell you, if you are looking to do an FPE door and have it look anything remotely close to ours. Now... I'm not saying that you can't get a, a shiny door at a cost-effective price point if you use a Graco handheld. You can. And if you're in a market that can only bear so much, like I'm not here to say give a client a $5,000 door if they can only afford a $1,200 paint, paint job on the door, right? Give, them, give your clients the thing that they can afford. But I'll tell you right now, get yourself a gravity-fed cup gun couple compressors for site work, a big compressor for shop work. You can get glass, glass, my friend, with a small amount of paint. I would not be trying to spray with a Graco battery-powered airless sprayer. Gen I wouldn't try to spray Holland Lack with an airless in general if it was me. But I understand that not everybody has all the tools and equipment that we have or clients who are paying as much as our clients do or have high as high of expectations. So I think we have to understand where you're coming where I have trying to understand where you're coming from. Um, but you generally we're not gonna spray Holland Lack out of the can. So if someone's people said they thought they thought you mean thinned. Um yeah, definitely want to thin it a little bit. Definitely want to do some samples before you just put it on a door. That's a, another pro tip. Um but let's see. So I hope that answers your question. I just, that's not best practice, but come to ZK Finishing School and we will show you every single step of the way and you will be doing crazy doors. Um, my friend SNN, what kind of air scrub are you guys using? Are you going with expensive brand or does it really matter? Thanks. Air scrubbers. Um, I mean, I think... All air scrub scrubbers are probably pretty similar. Yeah, you get what you pay for generally. I, I mean, you got to be careful. Actually, you go to those air scrubber, like negativeairmachines.com. There are definitely some air scrubbers I see that are like twice the price of other ones. And I'm like, I, I can't for the life of me understand where the price difference is. But 
generally, you know, you get a get a good scrubber and um, there's a difference between a scrubber and an air mover though. Um, but I the brand of air scrubber I have is not the one I would buy again. Um, they make plastic shells to air scrubbers. Um, the thousand, two thousand CFM air scrubbers, they, it's like a bright red plastic shell, not the big metal shell. I would go with that. It's just the metal shells are sharp and hard and the plastic's just like, I don't know. I feel like it's a little nicer. Yeah, we do use charcoal filters. Um, and in some cases and in other cases we exhaust outside. Um, it really depends on the situation. Somebody asked that question. Sorry for just randomly answering that. People on the podcast who didn't see that question come up. Or or people who watch this later on IGTV, you don't see the questions either, which is, you know, it is what it is. Um, but it would be cool, I think, I think, for context. Man, you guys are going to stop asking questions. This thing's never going to end. I haven't even got to the original ones yet. Uh, Graham 2 with two U's. Do you know any trade schools in Virginia by the coast? Um, I am not familiar with trade schools. I know of one school. It's called ZK Finishing School. Shout out to ZK Finishing School. Yo, thanks for the sweatshirt. Um, but no, I, I don't know of any trade schools in Virginia. I'm sorry. Um, all right, let's, let's get to these questions. ASA Painters says, one, how do you guys control the dust for FPE when you're not able to use the booth? Uh, I answered this question at the very beginning of this podcast slash live show. I'm not going to repeat myself. I used to do it all the time. I still do it all the time. What am I talking about? I'm going to try to just be like, refer or come to finishing school and we'll teach you how to do it in depth. In depth. Cole Bunderson, recommended reading material to fill out my painting education. Painting by Zach Kenny. It's an amazing book. You should all read it. It's for sale on every store you can buy. No, I'm lying. Side note, there's an Instagram account called Words Played. Word, plural words, played. One of my favorite follows right now. Definitely one of my favorite follows right now. The man is hysterical. He sells a book. And on every page of the book, it just says... Oh, man, I'm blanking on what it says. It's the name of the book. It's called, uh, who knows the name of that book? He has a book, and on every page it says one sentence. It's a, it's a, his whole thing is a sarcastic farce of a motivational speaker thing. It's gold. Sorry. To answer your question, um, man, what I did was I just bought every book on Amazon and eBay, and, um, <laughs> peruse through some of them there's a couple of them i've like looked at read intensely there's some old school books uh that have some amazing knowledge in them um yeah man i mean I, there's not a lot of them so just read every book there's probably nine painting books that i'm aware of of uh, you know professional painting books um so yeah i would read those all right so we talked about all the stuff that I obviously I as a as a passionate craftsman, right? My company's whole slogan is passion for craftsmanship. I'm a passionate craftsman. I freaking love nerding out about this stuff. That's my like initial that was my first love in painting. Um but now then I my second you know what my second love in painting is? As we get into these questions. My second love in painting became sales and marketing. Right? I love the painting. I said sales and marketing is for losers and companies who uh have crappy products and then i said well i'm so big i talked to a guy today he i he list last week i have to share this because this stuff kills me and we if you're not studying sales and marketing please do it it hurt my heart to talk to this man he's i was telling him he started at whatever we were talking about something and i was like he's like oh i'm so busy i'm so he asked me a question about pain i, I gave him a call and he's like Oh man, at some point I got to said something. He goes, I'm so busy. I was talking about, I was like, oh, you don't have an Instagram account? Oh yeah, so we're safe. I'm like, you don't have an Instagram account? And he was like, um, no, I don't have an Instagram account. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. And, uh, and I was like, 
Okay. Slow down. I don't care how busy you are. You could raise your rates if you got more busy and stayed just the same and whatever. We got to the point. This guy's in L.A., right? John, near L.A. He's telling me whatever. And I'm like, all right, so what's your charge rate? It could be higher. He charged $30 an hour. He estimates at $30 an hour. Any of you on here that are estimating at $30 an hour, quit, go work for somebody else, or raise your rates. Because at $30 an hour, with all the time you put into it, you are making way less than $30 an hour. You cannot afford to employ people. Like, factually, you cannot afford. I mean, unless you're going to pay them $10 an hour. $30 an hour is not enough to run a business. Like I can safely say that, and specifically in California, but I would argue there's no place in America where you could run a business billing at $30 an hour. Um, convince me that I'm wrong. Um, so that, the point of that was sales and marketing will raise your rates, will help you raise your rates, assuming you have good paint jobs that you're putting out. Sales and marketing will help you bring in more leads, you keep your workload the same, Prices go up because you supply and demand, basic supply and demand. Uh, so my second love in painting was sales and marketing. I had to learn to love it. I was not into it at all. I, I definitely, it's like crazy. You know when you like change opinions on something and you become like a diehard like evangelist for that idea because you were someone who was against it and now you believe in it so strongly? Well, that is me on sales and marketing. Um, that's why we teach a course on it. It's why I talk to anyone who will listen about it. Uh, it's why I'm on here right now, you know, selfishly. This this could be a, this is marketing in some way for my company. Um, so that was my second love. I'm now like, mm, that feels good. I like doing that, right? I hated it forever, but I trained my brain to like it because I saw the results of my hard work. Same with when I learned how to get better at painting. I saw the results of my hard work. So now that's just the preface to these questions that are coming up from John. Um, let's start with this one. John's the businessman. Oh man, John, we should partner up. Come to Rhode Island. Let's partner up. We will take over New England. Mm. Yin and yang, man. We will crush with your freaking analytics and your systems. And there's a few guys like that where I'm like, dude, if I just had someone like that, we would be ridiculous. So John said, are you making any big changes to business structure slash processes? The answer is, oh yeah. I don't know why I said it like that. That was really weird. Yes, yes we are. Um, so my first love was painting, craftsmanship, actual putting paint on things, prepping things, beautiful surfaces. My second love in painting was sales and marketing. My third love in painting, I'm, I pray, will become operations. It's good. I I need my company to run. Like a Swiss watch, the way we we apply Swiss watch paint jobs, and we have a broken down jalopy of an operations system. And it's all my fault. It's all because I started out by myself, just by like doing whatever, you know, like whatever. No one's my boss. I like I, so I have a lot of these bad habits as far as sort of like we don't have work orders. Well, the next every job going forward, we will have a work order. But up until now, we haven't had like formal work orders. We haven't had formal processes for operations. Um, it has been me talking to people and texting sometimes. That is not an effective way to run an organization. You can run a two man company where you're there every day with words and with text and do pretty well. You cannot run a nine person organization like we have where I'm not in the field all the time with words and text messages. And that's been a hard lesson to learn you know, it's the biggest pain point in my company by far. So the big structural changes that we're I'm going to be making and we're going to be making is we're going to get a, we're going to get our operations side the way we run behind the scenes to be in line with our sales and marketing and our paint production. That is my new goal. I'm reading books about it. I'm thinking about it. I'm 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 going to learn to love nerding out about operations the way I have the other ones. And now that hurt my, I, I get nervous saying that because it, today I don't love it. And, but I also didn't love sales and marketing at first. So 
we are going to get our very leaky organization. We leak a lot of profit out. We don't have a very profitable organization because of all these inefficiencies, right? I'm going to spend the next year honing in on processes and processes. Processes and processes. There's two words I'm trying to say that are different, I promise. But I just keep saying the same word, so I'm going to stop. Um, yeah, so that's the answer to that. I get nervous even talking about it. I have low, it makes me feel bad about myself, right? All that like self, negative self-talk. You're an idiot. Your company doesn't run fucking perfect. Freaking perfect, whatever. All those things, right? But I'm also smart enough to know that I know how to learn. I'm pretty good at learning. Um, and so I'm going to learn how to run a well-oiled, highly functional, behind-the-scenes operations in a company. Um, it's going to be fun. Like, I'm excited. I'm excited. I, I'm excited. <laughs> I am. I really am. I'm excited for what it's going to be like when I start to feel the be- reap the benefits of the hard work, of the pain of those first few push-ups you ever, like, oh, man, I'm in such bad shape, uh, which I am now, so push. I should be making that analogy. But, um, yeah, that's the answer to that question, John. Thank you for your question. Um, here's another one. Someone just asked, oh man, I think someone's, again, they're putting me up. Someone, Brock Solid Painting Company just asked, would you recommend Fast Rack Systems? Would I recommend Fast Rack? My man, I couldn't recommend Fast Rack more. I recommend Fast Rack to my grandma, to my mom. I recommend Fast Rack to everybody. My wife is staring at me like I'm a nut. Hey, that was funny. No. Um, uh, yeah, I, I 100%. I, 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 Zach Detmore from Detmore 101 posted. A, a, he had a post in, in, the, in the video. I saw one of the racks. I'm like, how are you looking at your racks? He said, I loved it. I was like, that is heirloom quality equipment. His kids will be inheriting that rack from Zach. The racks from Fast Rack, my children will be inheriting those racks. They are built to withstand a nuclear attack, Armageddon, and they'll be back on the other side still running. They are the cockroaches of the rack game. Uh, maybe you shouldn't use that. <laughs> maybe you shouldn't use that one on his marketing. But I would say it's safe to say there's nothing more durable than a fast rack. Uh, yeah, Brock Solid is a fake account for fast rack, asking me that question. I am fast rack's biggest fan. Uh, man, you will not be disappointed. You can throw it off a building and then go use it. That's how freaking amazing and durable they are. Don't throw them off a building, but you probably could get away with it. Um, Paint School John says, do you spend any time reflecting on numbers and progress for the year? When? Right now I have been. Uh, I, but I am meet, I meet with my accountant now once a month, actually every two weeks right now, as we start to really go deep into getting the accounting and the operation side, we have a standing every two week meeting where we meet, or my bookkeeper, I should say, um, we are, I'm working really hard to get all my numbers to be, um, first of all, to have all, I have all, I have a, I have all the numbers kind of in categories and stuff, and it's really not true information so i so we're this we're working to get all of the information to be true and accurate and tell a true story and then we're that's the goal right now and then the goal is to play with things and watch what happens with numbers right and and yes i'm excited i'm excited to do that i really am no i am i i won't be gritting my teeth i'll be smiling as i go through it but it is definitely tough for me to sit down. I, this week, I did it. Like, I sat in my office, like, all day, two days. Whew. That is not... I'm like the little kid. Or I'm actually like my dog. When we like, try to tell my dog, like, she couldn't come in the room because she was trying to puke. And she goes to, like, the blankets and, like, digs in... Or in the dirty laundry pile and, like, digs in it to puke. So we had her in the kitchen. And she couldn't go. And she would walk up to the door. She would look at it. And she would scratch. And we would say, no. Nope. And then we were like, divert her. Come, come over here. Sit with her. Hang out. Two minutes later, she's right back. Right? That was me in the office. I just kept like, I just kept standing. Like, I had six or seven impulses to like flee. <laughs> but 
this week I sit, I sat there, I stayed and, and that's, that's a muscle, right? It's super weak right now. And I, I'm really working to flex it and to get it strong so I can be like John and Jason Paris. Well, I'll never be like Jason Paris. If I can only hope to be a 10th as good at all of this stuff as Jason Paris is, um, Nick Slavic, all Jason, um, not Jason Garrett. That's the coach of the Cowboys, right? No. Is he, he, I don't know. If he, he was the coach of the Cowboys at one point. I don't watch sports anymore, really. Except for MMA. Um, but Garrett Painting, Shane Garrett, he runs it. I mean, there's a lot of people who run great organizations. I want to be more like them. Um, and pairing that with the awesome group of people we have in the company, the awesome clients, the super high level work that we're able to achieve, and the beautiful marketing that we were able to put out, um, I'm really hopeful for where we're going to go. So that gets to the next question. How motivated are you for 2021? Dude, let's go. I can't wait. This is going to be... <laughs> yeah, Jason Paris, don't want to put a paintbrush in his hand. Definitely don't want to put a paintbrush in his hand. But man, you get that guy in front of a spreadsheet. Whew. He's the Elon Musk of the paint game. It's been said many times. I did not come up with it. Um, I couldn't be more excited for 2021 because it's the next year. It's, it's the future. It's the next thing. Like, you know, we have been working so hard in this company and I've been working so hard to get better every day and to build this foundation and to get great paint jobs executed. And we are doing that. And so now it's like, now it's, we get to work on efficiencies. And at the end of the day, I'm working to put money in the bank. Like this year, I gotta we we're gonna get profitable, and I'm really excited for that. And 2021's been a great year, and 2021 will be a great year, and 2022 will be a great year. All the years are great, but I am excited for 2021. There's no question. Um. All right, folks. I think that is all of the questions. Whew, we made it. A few of you are still here. Everyone's leaving now. But again, I will see you guys Tuesday night for the interview portion of ZK Live. I appreciate appreciate everyone rolling with me tonight. I was a little goofy. I drank tea. I went, ah. And uh, yeah, I think we got some good information out. I really appreciate your questions. Could not do this. Well, I probably could do this show without your questions, but it would be very boring and it wouldn't be adding value to the world. And so I wouldn't keep doing it. Um, so again, go to all those like iTunes, Spotify places and rate and review and all that stuff. Tell all your friends, tell your grandmother, tell your mom, tell your dad. There's this awesome show. It's called ZK Live. You really should listen to it. Um, I don't know because... Don't do that. That would probably be silly. But again, everybody, thanks for watching. Have a great night.